When I started this channel over two years ago, it was in anticipation for the release of classic World of Warcraft. Back then, it was a mix of nostalgia, the huge amount of hype, and the idea that we really were going to be able to go back and see it as it was then. And throughout the duration of the game, I found that there was more to it than purely nostalgia keeping me hooked. I hadn't played World of Warcraft that consistently the whole way through since the Wrath of the Lich King era of the game. Sometimes older games, the ones that laid foundations for future ones to come, just did a truly huge amount of things right. Though they may not look as great as the modern titles, in many ways they were better. It's very easy to see older games in the past as the glory days, discounting it wasn't just the game, it was the people you met and you played with. It was that carefree point in your life, and it was when these games launched, they were brand new. They were the hyped up thing that everybody had to try. Hello ladies and gents from Willie here. I'd like to welcome you to what I hope to make a mainstay series on the channel. I miss having something to properly dive into, play, think about, research, redo, produce. I think my best content comes from when I have an opportunity to sit back and give myself the time to do this. And I want to make this as good as I can and something to be proud of. If you don't want to miss one of these videos going out, consider subscribing. And if you enjoy the idea and do want to see more, give it a like as well. I also have a patron if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, and I'd like to thank all the amazing people on there who already help me do what I do, but more on that at the end. Let's begin. I'm starting off with the game in a rather interesting position, near universally praised as one of the greatest large-scale PvP experiences from the early 2000s, a game which combines multiple fantasy tropes, and a game which despite the success at the time, has not been able to secure a lasting future. I want to answer Dark Age of Camelot. Was it any good though? Releasing 9th October 2001, Dark Age of Camelot was born at the time when MMORPGs were booming, and against stiff competition from the market, established titles or banked IPs were at their peak. This was three years before World of Warcraft would appear on the scene and began to gradually sap players from all of the titles. It was perhaps the latest it could have launched to have a real impact on the genre. Bizarrely though, some form of paying to play was required all the way up to 2019, a point in time when frankly the majority of the once vibrant MMO was very, very, very long gone. The move to including free to play on the same year saw a predictable bump in logins, but nothing significant. There are of course other servers, if you know what I mean, as is typical with older MMOs, but for this I'm going to be focusing on the official service, as that should be seen as the baseline as for what to expect from the game and how it has aged. I imagine other channels will do the other clients, this one ain't it. Opening up the launch of the first time, we're greeted by a rather modest offering before getting into the game. No music, no animations, not terribly inspiring. Hitting the play button though, and things came to life, and you're presented with picking your server type. A big decision for an MMO. Now for Dark Age of Camelot, there is a choice to be made here. Preferred, best for new players. In my experience, that means the servers where they want more people to go, because there's not many people on them. I did that mistake when I first started WoW. We have archive servers where old characters can move to normal ones, and normal servers with your regular game rule set. The vanilla experience, if you will. And finally, alternate rule set servers. These contained a number of changes to remove restrictions between realms, read factions, including grouping and PvP tags. Moreover, on a PvP server, dying in PvP combat loses experience and kills gain experience among other targeted changes. Very interesting. However, for the time being, I started on a normal server to gain my bearings. Heading into the title screen with music booming, I was instantly prompted to pick my faction. These range between Midgard, small and wide Viking types from Norse mythology, Albion, Arthurian knights with chivalry honor and all that stuff, and then Hibernia, Celtic mages and enchanters in tune with nature. I went with Hibernia because magic is cool in games and you can't convince me otherwise. I then had to choose my race between Elf who looked, well, you know how Elves look in fantasy games, don't you? The Celt, a versatile human-like race who is the jack of all trades, master of none, and the Furbolg, wait, sorry, Furbolg, I decided Elf because at least you're trying to get into the fantasy setting in about the most basic way possible without picking the human race. Of course we went with the mentalist class or way, a mental elf. 
Perfect. Onwards we go then. Customization wise for my character, it was surprisingly good for something as old as it is outside of the model snapping back when each new option was picked. Keep in mind this game is from 2001. Eventually I landed on this fine creation that looked as though he shaved hair from somewhere else on his body and then stuck it like a bridge on his forehead. I picked a few starting attributes I thought would benefit a mage type playstyle and voila, I was done. And after hitting random name once or twice, I landed upon the one that would fit for my hero. Behold, the Valiant, the Magnificent, Finn Den Den, we'll call him Finn for short. My character gave me a cheer with all the enthusiasm of a Blizzard employee learning they've just received 100 honor points for their hard work instead of a bonus that affords them to live indoors and we were off. Straight away into the starting area of Finn Lane. I was greeted by an entourage of tutorials where I quickly realized there was going to be a lot going on here between inventory gearing, specialization, attributes, combat styles, and a literal spell book of spell books, which I already had, it was all quite a lot at once. I made my way to the mentalist trainer and found adding points to my specialization unlocked new abilities, but you could only discover what you could get as you put more points into that specific tree. These included new ranks and entirely new spells. Were I a player back in 2001, this alone would have set me off grinding for many hours to get hold of the most powerful spells that lay at the end of said trees. On top of this, there are realm abilities further allowing you to customize your character, though I didn't have any of these yet. Because shortly after that, I was set off to defeat my first enemy, the Fierce Wild Crouch. I found that I couldn't cast spells whilst being attacked. Makes sense, I suppose. If I was waving my arms about doing some magic and somebody jabbed me in the dick, that would be moderately distracting. So like the true fledgling wizard would, I beat it over the head with my stick until it fell over. Repeat two more times. Happy classic MMORPG questing. What more do you need? The follow-up quest gave me directions to a pack of wolves that I had to deal with. Being the MMO veteran I am, all too familiar with following compass directions to find my objectives, I thought, ha, this will be no problem, I'll have them dealt with in a couple of minutes. I then promptly got very lost and went completely the wrong direction. At least with Dark Age of Camelot, they give your character a little purple marker on the map about the size of a speck of dust that had been dropped on your screen, which I didn't notice for a while. Backtracking to town, I found my way to the wolves, dealt with the situation in short order, and whilst the wolves were no problem, what was becoming noticeable, however, was the literal litany of spells Mr. Finn de Dendua had learned in his short time in Hibernia. For real, during the travel time between each quest and objective, I spent most of that trying to work out how many new ranks or just entirely new spells had appeared under the magic tab in such a short space of time. I hadn't even trained the majority of them, they were just appearing like magic. Many of these were different ranks of spells, but they also had different names, which was confusing at first, but the icons on the spells shows the progression path of each quite clearly. Next point of order was to deal with encroaching Albion troops who we don't like because they're wearing a different colour. It's usually something like that with factions anyway. On the way I found a bard that hasted the player giving me a 15 minute movement speed buff to help me get around the world a little bit faster. I wonder how late into the game a feature like this was added or was it there from the very start to give players the impression that bards are supports? Hmm. Anyways, down the hill and into the water and wow, would you look at that? You can swim in this game. How about that new world? What a crazy idea. Into the next zone I went and I have a feeling this is the part of the game where you get taught that things are going to be dangerous. Like the caves in the Orc or Night Elf starting zones in World of Warcraft or the vineyard full of Defias in Elwyn, the classic noob traps. The Albion troops were the first aggressive enemies that I had met. Initially, things were going fine, but not being able to cast whilst under attack quickly became a rather substantial problem. So I retreated my character to supposed safety, only to find that both the player and enemies can swim, and so I made my last stand. I probably would have won if I just stuck it out and auto-attacked, but no, I met my first of many deaths in Dark Age of Camelot. But the journey with the quest was not done. I resurrected up and ran back. We still had to destroy the Albion commander. These guys were orange, meaning they should be a challenge for my character at my level. But I'm a mentalist, I thought. It will be no problem. Well, you know what? It was a problem, and I was beginning to question whether I was doing things in the right way and the way they were meant to be done. Back I went though and did some contemplating before the next battle. And you know what? It may look very basic, but there was something nice about this brief moment of respite. The sound design in Dark Age of Camelot had stood out to me straight away. In built-up areas, there is this background chatter and noises, the varied sound of footsteps on different services, that the oofs and owls of combat, and a rather relaxing and calming ambience when out in foot in 
in the countryside. If you think about it, game designers have always had access to the best sounds possible. It's just been improvements made in how they are recorded. Either way, you can tell a lot of effort has been put into this aspect of the game and it shows. But back to business, I had a commander to deal with. This time I rotated my spells between a stun and a single target nuke that I had which did the most damage. And after taking him down, suddenly the game felt that little bit easier. Next up was to deal with Midgard, the third faction of Dark Age of Camelot. So off I went where I ran into one or two problems. See, it wasn't always entirely clear who you were actually hitting or whether multiple mobs were going to chain pull. And once you enter combat, it was pretty hard to get out of again, which led me to several unfortunate series of events. And this was before I had found the sprint button, by the way. I even tried to do a highly unethical mage one pull when I found that the forces of Midgard aren't too interested in things such as collision and making sense and could just teleport through wherever they wanted. I'll have to keep that one in mind. After dying once or twice and spamming various respawn buttons, I ended up in a built up area Tia Nednog, where I saw the first other player since logging in, though the immediate thought after landing here was, oh great, it's going to take me hours to figure out how I get back to where I was, when I remembered I saw a recall stone in my bag. Nice. So back to dealing with Midgard then. After several further inspections that death mechanics were indeed working correctly, I opened my spellbook to find that roughly 37 more spells have been added at some point or another. Seriously, the rate at which you're given things in Dark Age of Camelot is crazy. I'm so used to slow pace from the start of MMORPGs, but this felt completely different and it was great. And then I found out that thing that would change the game for me. The Mentalist class had a mind control effect where you can have an enemy humanoid function as a pet. This was a spell you got given at level 4. I have somehow accidentally picked a pet class or an occasional pet class once again and I headed back to camp feeling as though I had a little bit of a better idea of the basics of the game. Next off I was ported to Magmel where I encountered much of the same as I did initially. Go to location, kill things, repeat. I did run into an epic encounter where it was clear multiple players were designed to organically group to take out a large dangerous enemy for a reward appropriate to the level. It was these kind of ideas that drove much of the emergent gameplay in earlier MMOs, build the mountain and people will climb it just because it's there. Speaking of group content, something Dark Age of Camelot has shown a lot of emphasis on is the grouping systems. It's one of the very first things taught to the player, it clearly shows us an option whenever you click on somebody else, and the group UI is contained and given the same importance as things such as your magic spellbook and abilities. You can tell the devs wanted you to get together with others and get stuck into the challenges that the world offers, and even from the early game questing it's apparent that this is a world you aren't expected to go alone in. Even mobs slightly higher level than you can pose a real threat if you're not approaching them with the respect that they deserve. I mean I got beat up by a water beetle twice. I had to go and find a humanoid to mind control to do the day work for me. But that's how I figured out to make what I have chosen to play work for me. It's all the hallmarks of an early MMO. Brute focused, RPG heavy, doesn't hold your hand when it comes to difficulty. Unfortunately though, as we'll get a bit more onto later, the confidence in having made a great game that players will be there and groups will be active falls over completely when it's been two decades and it's only legacy players really sticking around. Speaking of groups though, in Magmel I found a teleporter to the first First dungeon, Weir's Tomb, and I thought, sure I'll give it a look, why not? No other players around of course, but with my awesome mind control powers I wanted to see what this place looked like. So into the crypt I went, once I realised how you actually get in, there wasn't really anything indicating where the start of the instance was. After the customary looking as though the game's going to crash loading screen, I was in, and the atmosphere was dark and spooky, many tight corners hiding enemies waiting to ambush you. Thankfully the first enemy that did ambush me was shortly mind controlled, and I made it some way using my mind control skills until it dropped off at a bad time and I got sent to a respawn. And it was at this point a gripe with Dark Age of Camelot had started to come up. The control scheme for the character, I can only conclude it's been designed by a lunatic. Pressing left or right will strafe your character in those directions. Holding right click and then moving your mouse around will turn your character, but it is as if they are on a 360 degree wheel, leading to you often trying to turn and run away from something, but you're battling with the controls just as much as the enemies. And then to actually turn and face another character instantly, you have to use the face button or keybind after stopping moving. It just all seems needlessly complicated and had already been the source of several deaths. It's something I've no doubt you would get used to and learn to play around, but it was poor nevertheless. 
last. At this point, I noticed another teleport to a battleground, so I decided to hop straight in. I landed in the Hills of Claret, where each faction had a fort to hold, and there were quests there to take out opposing faction members. This was around a level 10 battleground, and there were options to join for even lower combat brackets than that. I was reservedly hopeful there would be a shred of PvP left given the age of the game and the legacy around great PvP are left behind, but I was ultimately disappointed. I was running around a total barren wasteland, only populated by a couple of NPCs left over who probably hadn't witnessed another human being in years. After a few circles of the battleground and being domed by NPCs massively higher level than me once or twice, I called it quits. I then set off on a bit of exploration of the world. It wasn't the most breathtaking graphically as expected from its age, very much so, but again the soundtrack and sound design made up for it in a large way. Moreover, Dark Age of Camelot had day and night cycles. To this day there are titles which still do not do this. There were weather effects that occurred, I'm not sure if it was random or zone specific, but it was another touch to add to the realism of the world. And perhaps the biggest feature I was surprised by, you can look inside open windows from outside into buildings. I'm not quite sure why this amazed me so much, I swear this is a feature that doesn't occur all too often, and again added to the immersion of world building. I began to work my way through the next zone, and it very much felt like a continuation of what I had done so far. I wasn't expecting a crazy innovative level leveling experience, but this was your standard MMORPG fair of kill, collect in one area, go to next area, repeat, eventually get to a high level, then do endgame things, but as a newer or returning player that doesn't make much sense to put up a barrier like that when the servers are practically empty in the first place. Nobody is going to be spending dozens of hours to reach an endgame that needs players only to find an empty void. There has to be a way to get into the meta content, surely. The game is old enough where things have been sped up a bit, right? I wanted more of the PvP, that's the area of the game that had left the biggest impression on players' minds. So was there an official way for me to try and hop into some Dark Age of Camelot PvP? Maybe some character templates, a fun battleground mode, anything like that? Well, simply put, no. There wasn't at all. There were the normal servers where I was currently playing, or the alternate rule set servers which only had the co-op server available, and that's their version of PvE, with very limited PvP options which seem to defeat the point a little of how the game is built up. In fact I went to have a check and surely enough at 5.30pm there were 10 people on the co-op servers, it looked a bit like classic era to be honest. Over on the normal realms where I was playing about the same time there were 95 players total. Perhaps enough for some realm v realm if everybody hops on at the same time, but a huge uphill grind for a newer player to gain access to the content. And since this is what the live servers offered, this is where things kind of stopped for me. When an MMO that has such a strong emphasis on interfaction conflict and player grouping thrives, it's one of the most engaging online experiences you can have, but when they start to fail they die at a tremendously rapid rate. The gradual attrition of not being able to fill out rosters, one or two people leaving, organisers for PvP or PvE deciding to take a break and not returning, and the uphill battle for the newer player to break into the endgame all the whilst being tormented by those who vastly outmatch them in gear, ability and often skill. Also the game might have had a free to play option as of 2019, but it's very much restricted in the scope of what you're able to do in game, you're limited on race class choices, trade skills, guilds, buffs, in fact just about everything the game possibly has to offer, and to unlock these benefits you either have to purchase the in-game store currency Mithril, or set up a monthly subscription fee which is $14, old school RuneScape is 11 Final Fantasy 14 is 13 World of Warcraft is 15 how on earth is Dark Age of Camelot $14? Oh wait, Broadsword is owned by EA. Okay yeah, I take it back, it all makes perfect sense. If you did fancy some nostalgia and you wanted to get somewhere in the game for real, it's going to take you much, much more time until you want to get the wallet out. And for what Dark Age of Camelot can offer in 2022, it feels very poor value for money considering other offerings currently available. Another barrier to entry, the game hardly needed. You can tell there is a shell here of something that used to be great that's now been left in the dust, and the more I think about what I've seen here, the more it's a shame. Dark Age of Camelot was one of the frontier men of the MMORPG PvP scene, bringing the idea of mass scale PvP to many players worldwide. Its soundtrack and audio effects have aged very well, maybe excluding the death sound of the elf, perhaps I heard that one too many times. The world, whilst extremely basic in its scope, is what you can expect from 
such an early MMO and does a fine job of situating the player in a fantasy setting. The movement controls were a low point for me and just felt clunky and overcomplicated for what they needed to achieve. The combat was interesting even at a low level, I've seen few games bombard you with so many abilities early on. Saying this, with the age of the game, were you to find yourself at level cap, people will heavily rely on meta template builds. Whilst the idea of theory crafting all these different ability and stat combos is novel, it would ultimately be futile in any competitive setting, more of a fun PvE thing to do I bet. Perhaps the bigger shame isn't the lack of players on the official servers for OG Dark Age of Camelot, but the fact that a sequel was planned, Camelot Unchained, which was kickstarted in 2013, eventually raised four and a half million dollars, entered a beta stage in 2018, and then announced last year they've actually secretly been working on an entirely different game and made a new engine, but don't worry it's totally gonna benefit Camelot Unchained in the long run. Oh, and there was also rumours that the studio was in total financial disarray. The fans of the Dark Age of Camelot Realm v Realm may just be waiting quite a bit longer before they see anything remotely modern pop up on the market for them. I see with a passion for Dark Age of Camelot group of players back in the early 2000s though, a solid RPG setting, big emphasis on group and battlegrounds that can be joined even from the lowest combat levels. It's a shame I wasn't able to explore the PvP side of the game in any official capacity. I, and frankly I wouldn't expect any person to have to do this, shouldn't be expected to grind normally to level cap to get a chance to experience what the endgame might be about if I'm lucky enough to have a few dozen players have me tag along for the ride. There is simply no point in the grind when you can see there's nothing waiting for you at the end. For all I liked about Dark Age of Camelot, it was a short revisit for me personally, and knowing how MMOs are and what they entail, I wish I had more reasons to keep going. But in the end, the only hope for me to experience something akin to what Dark Age of Camelot offered in the early 2000s, things like it will be Camelot Unchained, and who knows when that is going to be dropping. So, Dark Age of Camelot, was it any good though? For me, I'm going to have to give it a wish I played it back in the day because I love large scale PvP and theory crafting, but these days there isn't enough active players on live servers and they have too high a barrier level of entry for newer players. Out of? The game got bought out by EA in 2006, and aside from minor class changes, they only appear to have aggressively monetized a once great game with an ever shrinking population. Drop your thoughts on the video below whether you liked it and whether you played it back then and whether you would consider giving it another go now. Any ideas for another MMORPG you'd like me to cover? Do let me know. Another big thank you to all the patrons who directly support the channel and let me spend more time on the bigger projects. If you want to help out as well, you can do so for less than the price of a cup of tea. As always, thank you all so much for watching and listening in. I hope you all have an amazing day and I shall see you all in the next one very soon.